Well, you probably want to know how I became a monolopia. And it's very simple. When I was uh, working in the New York book publishing industry back in the 1950s and 60s, which of course is ancient history, uh, a gentleman by the name of Calvin Hoffman came to my office. I was at Grosset and Dunlap, that famous company that produced the Hardy Boys and the Nancy Drews and all those wonderful books. He came to my office because we had started a quality paperback line and he wanted us to um, reprint his book entitled The Murder of the Man Who Was Shakespeare. Uh, he had done a lot of research, he had read all of Marlow, he had read all of Shakespeare, and he came to the conclusion that Marlow was the author of the 36 plays in the uh, first folio. And the only way that he could prove that was to come out with the uh, assertion that Marlow was not actually killed in 1593 as reported in the history books, but that it was a faked death, and it was faked in order for him to escape from the, uh, from the Archbishop uh, Whitgift's uh, inquisition. Uh, at the time, uh, Whitgift was going after atheists and blasphemers and Catholics and Puritans. And uh, Mahler was being indicted. He was being uh, questioned. And of course, he was, uh, the, the threat of his being killed was very real that he would be uh, executed. And uh, he was a member of the Secret Service. And he was working for Lord Gurley, who was Queen Elizabeth's right-hand man. You see. So he, he was in touch with the most important people in Elizabeth's government. And Gurley, who was very concerned about his spy, his agent, Malo, and wanted to make sure that he was not uh, you know, done away with by the uh, Inquisition, this decided that the only way they could save the man was to take him to the cliffs. He wanted to be, he wants, he asks the guide, he says, can you take me to the cliffs we're overlooking Dover? And the guide says, I know every step of the way. I know every style, every, if by style you mean the little stairs over the fences. And he's practically telling us that, well, Mahler was telling us, well, I know every step of the way because my mother took me there, you see. It's things like that which you would not know, you would not spot in, 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 uh, in Shakespeare's works unless you had read Mahler. Now, Mahler's father was a cobbler. So Mahler came from a very um, uh, common family. Now, he had great respect for his father, great love for his father. As a matter of fact, if you read Julius Caesar, the opening lines in Julius Caesar, the opening scene, there's a group of people who are there who want to greet Caesar as he arrives. And the police don't like this, all of these people around, so they, they question everybody, and one of them questions this man, and they, and they say, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a cobbler. He said, well, what does a cobbler do? And he says, I repair souls. <laughs> it's very interesting how Mahler was able to put his father right in at the beginning of Julius Caesar. And this has nothing to do with the play. It's all about being a cobbler. But that's the kind of thing that Mahler did in all these plays. And of course, the first folio, which was published in, uh, in uh, 1623, has that famous picture of Shakespeare. I don't know if all of you can see that. This is the picture of Shakespeare. Right. Now you'll see this is a mask. That's not a real human being. It's a mask, and you can actually see the outline of the mask around the neck. But an interesting thing about it, if you look at the bottom and see who was the publisher, it said printed by Isaac uh, Laggard. Jagger, it's really J, it's not L. And Ed Blount. Do you know who Ed Blount was? He was Mahler's executor. Mm -hmm. He was the publisher of A Hero and Leander. He knew Marlowe. He knew Marlowe as a young 
playwright, as a young writer, because Mahler used to go to the book stalls at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, where um, Ed Blount had his, one of his, had a bookstore. Ed Blount was a publisher. And so he got, Ed Blount got to know Mahler very well. And of course, um, when, uh, when Mahler was supposed to have been killed, Blount knew that it was a fake death. Why did he know that? Because when Mahler went into exile in Italy and wrote these plays, they had to be conveyed back to England. He had to get them to London. Now, how did he do that? Well, first of all, he was a member of the Secret Service. So wherever he was living in Italy, and we think it might have been Padua, uh, where there was a British emissary, because there was a, uh, a, a university in Padua where many Englishmen went to study law. And there was probably a, a British consul or whatever. And all he had to do was take the plays, put them in a diplomatic pouch, and that was brought to London. And now who would, who would get it? It would be Lord Burley. And who was Lord Burley? He was the Queen's right-hand man. See, Marlowe had developed over the years a kind of father-son relationship with Lord Burley, and uh, as, as, a, as one of Burley's best spies, intelligence agents. So the manuscripts would come get back to England on a, on a, through a, a diplomatic pouch. And then Barley, uh, Burley would give the manuscript to Sir Thomas Walsingham, who was Marlowe's best friend and benefactor. Uh, Walsingham would have the, the original <coughs> manuscript copied by a scribe. And then they would be delivered by Ed Blount. Blount was the was the, uh, the the contact man between Malo and and Walsingham and Shakespeare. Shakespeare had been hired as a front man. He was a very clever businessman. Shakespeare, very intelligent, clever businessman who got rich at a time when very few commoners could get rich. And he got rich because he was very well paid by Walsingham and Burley and whoever was the, the paymaster, so to speak. Now, it's interesting that when, when Shakespeare received these manuscripts, everybody remarked at how clean they were. Not a single blot. As a matter of fact, Johnson, Ben Johnson remarked, uh, there wasn't a single blot on these uh, the manuscripts. Why? Because they had been copied, you see. They had been copied by a scribe and then brought over to Shakespeare. And that's how those manuscripts got to the Globe Theater and were produced. Now, the interesting thing about the first folio is that it also contains plays that had never been staged. The, uh, we wouldn't even know they existed today if, it, if they had not been put into the first folio. So Ed Blount, the publisher, knew where to find them. He not only knew where to find the plays that had been produced by the Globe, uh, the company, and by Shakespeare's company, but he also knew where to find the plays that hadn't been produced, unpublished plays. But, so that's, those are the logistics of this whole system, which worked very well and very beautifully, and of course, uh, when uh, they were all collected for the first folio, that's, they had to have a name on it. Now, Shakespeare had been the front, and he was a very discreet person. He never told anybody. He might not even have known who was the original writer of the manuscripts. You know, in those days, just because you knew a secret, you didn't necessarily tell it to anyone. In other words, you kept quiet because uh, as I've said in, in, in other talks, punishment was very severe in those days if you did anything to uh, undercut the throne or anything like that. You know, they, in those days they beheaded people. And also they had a very cruel punishment known as being drawn and quartered. Very ugly, horrible thing. So uh, you didn't want to uh, say anything that even if you might have known 
about this, and certainly uh, Ed Blount knew. He knew the whole thing from beginning to end. And that's why I consider him to be the most important person in this entire conspiracy from beginning to the end. Because he knew everybody and he was the, the, the contact person between Mahler's uh, works and Shakespeare. So that's, the, that's just part of the story. Another interesting part of this story is that Biographies of Marlow tell you they don't know anything about him from the age of 8 to 14. Now what, was, what would a, uh, a precocious young person be doing between the ages of 8 and 14? He would become a page. Now a page was like a young gopher who would be uh, employed by a nobleman. And, the, and if you read um, Love's Labor's Lost, you would see in the relationship of the, one of the major characters with his page, that the page is more intelligent than his master. Very interesting, because certainly Mahler was a, uh, was a born genius. Is very, very precocious. Well, he was employed by, I believe he was employed by Sir Philip Sidney before he was a, fir, a sir. Philip Sidney at the age of 17 was embarking on a two-year tour of Europe. He was a nobleman, came from a very wonderful family. And uh, so he, uh, he toured Europe with servants. In those days, you know, if you were a nobleman, you had a whole, you had a whole entourage that went with you servants and probably a page. And I believe, and I, I have not been able to find absolute truth of this, but everything seems to fit, that Christopher Mahler was his page. And the reason why I say that is that everybody says, well, how did this commoner get to know how the aristocracy lives, how the other side lives? Well, there was, there was Mahler, you know, living with the aristocracy as a page to this nobleman, and he knew what their values were, he knew what they were concerned about, and, and he knew how they lived. <clears throat> and um, so he served from the age of 8 to 14. And at the age of 14, he immediately entered the King's School, which was the prestigious prep school in, uh, in Canterbury preparing him for further education at Cambridge. He, he was at Cambridge for, so he had two years at, at the Canterbury School, the King's School, and six years at Cambridge. He had the very best education that an Englishman could have in the Elizabethan era. Now what was Shakespeare's education? Nil, zilch, nothing. We have no information at all that, uh, that Shakespeare attended any school of any kind, even the grammar school in his own town. There's no documentation that he attended that, even though it was free. Now, it's possible that he did attend it, but we don't know. We don't have any corroboration about that. But in any case, Mahler had the education that made it possible for him to write the kind of plays he wrote, particularly a play like Love's Labor's, Labor's Lost that had to be written by a university man because it really is a satire about the academics, the academic mentality. And it's a beautiful work. It's, uh, uh, and Harold Bloom calls it a spectacular uh, work uh, about words and vocabulary and all of that. So, so we know that, uh, so my, my view is that he was a page. And as I say, we don't have any, any uh, uh, a, 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 you know, explicit proof of that, but that's one of the things I want to do research on when I go to England. And I think I may be, about, may be able to corroborate that once and for all. Yes? Sorry, as I recall, Love's Labor is Lost is actually about euphemies, isn't it? And, and which would seem to corroborate. I mean, there's a lot of talk of euphemies, of, of euphemies. Yeah, yeah, which was which a, is which would, would relate directly to Mr. Yeah, Oh, well, definitely, because that was a literary movement. 
but the point about the, the point about um, <coughs> uh, Marlowe was this interesting trip, this interesting tour of Europe. They just happened to go to Paris, and what took place while they were in Paris? There was this marriage that was to take place between uh, the Huguenot princess and one of the uh, Catholic princes. And the whole idea was that they would unite somewhere and, and this religious dispute between the Huguenots, who were Protestants, Calvinists, and the Catholics would in some way be healed. But Catherine de' Medici, who was the mother of the prince, mother of the, of the king, said, hey, because of their, all the Huguenot leadership was in Paris at the time for the wedding, they said, hey, this is a golden opportunity to kill them all. And this is what they did. So you had that, that massacre, the St. Bartholomew Day massacre in Paris, just at the time when uh, Philip Sidney and Marlowe were there. And Marlowe later on in life writes a play entitled Massacre in Paris. And it was written from the point of view of somebody who many believe someone who had to have been there. So he had a fabulous memory, incidentally. Marlowe was known for his great memory. Now, so Marlowe left um, the employ of Philip Sidney at the age of 14. He entered the, the um, King's School. And at the age of 15, something very interesting happened. Philip Sidney's sister, Mary Sidney, married an elderly gentleman by the name of the Earl of Pembroke, the second Earl of Pembroke. He had had two wives and no issue. Now, she married him at the age of 15. Marla was 13. She was 15. She married the Earl at the age of, of 15. They were married for two years, and nothing came of it. And, the, and it was probably, they, they probably all decided that the Earl is infertile. And so the Earl probably told, um, told the Countess, the Countess of Pembroke, Mary Sidney, my dear, I want an heir. I don't care how you get me that heir, just get me an heir. <laughs> now, heirs were very important in those days because that was the only way that you could continue the noble line. And many families died out because they didn't have heirs. So he was very concerned about being able to, you know, have the next Earl of Pembroke, the third heir Earl of Pembroke. So, what was Mary to do? Who could she turn to? Well, she knew her brother's page, this 15-year-old, handsome, intelligent young man, full of testosterone. <laughs> and uh, what she did was she seduced him. How? We don't know the logistics of it, but all we know is that nine months later, the third Earl of Pembroke was born. William Herbert, W.H., and that's the W.H. on the sonnets. You see, the, the sonnets are dedicated to W.H., William Herbert, Marlowe's son. But you see, since Marlowe was a nobody, a social nobody, he was no threat, you know. It wasn't like in the, uh, when, when the nobles were carrying on and creating bastards. You know, who were known, and they knew who the father was. In this case, this was very discreet, very hushed up, very secretive. Mary never told anybody who had, who was the father of her child. But we assume that somewhere along the line, the Earl of Pembroke, the third Earl of Pembroke, found out or knew. Because who do you think was the financial uh, patron of the first folio, the third Earl of Pembroke. So 
So you got Ed Blount, you got the third Earl of Pembroke, all of these people uh, who, were, who were close to, uh, to uh, Marlowe. And of course, when Mary married the, Earl, or the second Earl of Pembroke, she, she became a very wealthy woman. The Countess of Pembroke was one of the most wealthy women in England, and she was very much interested in literature. She wrote poetry, and she was also very much interested in drama. And she espoused the views of the French dramatist Garnier, who, who wrote plays about nobility and kings and that sort of thing. And she said, we ought to have plays like that, too. Well, she knew Marlowe. And she, per she persuaded her husband to create a theater group, Pembroke's Men. Now, the Earl of Pembroke was too busy to worry about a theater group. So who was in charge, who was going to be directing all of that, was uh, Mary Sidney, the Countess. She was in charge of that. She knew Marlow, and they were the ones who staged Marlow's plays. So you can see how everything ties in very nicely. Uh, in any case, things changed dramatically when Marlow, of course, underwent this fake death and went into exile and had to change his name. Uh, everybody, quiet, everybody went silent about all of this. But nevertheless, he managed to keep writing. And of course, he wrote these great, brilliant plays. Now, the interesting thing of people often ask me, why should we care who wrote the plays of Shakespeare? Well, as we know, there have been many writers in history. You know, I collect antiquarian magazines, old magazines, you know, like the Century Magazine or Harper's Magazine. Uh, you read articles written by wonderful writers, but you don't know them. You don't. They never made uh, made it permanently. You don't know who they are. The names there don't even ring a bell. Occasionally, there's one name that might. Uh, you might recognize, like Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote for some magazines. But the others, nothing. But the reason why we're so concerned about Shakespeare is because for 400 years, people have recognized the works in the first folio as being the greatest literary works in all of human history. Nothing better, nothing better. No one has come close to anything that's in those 36 plays. And so the thought is, well, who is this great genius who wrote these plays? There has always been this, this, uh, uh, this curiosity. And you want to know something about him. You want to know what kind of a mentality did he have? What kind of a life did he lead? And the first inkling that people had, that, or that somebody had, that, he, that Shakespeare was not a playwright came in, uh, in the late uh, 18th century when a clergyman, uh, his name slips my mind, but he, he so admired the plays of Shakespeare that he wanted to do a biography of him. He said, I've got to do a biography of this man. He's, he's, he's just a great playwright. And so he didn't live too far from Stratford. And, he, and so he moved to Stratford, took uh, rooms there, and he spent the next months exploring Stratford, exploring the whole area to find, he said, well, Shakespeare must have had a, a tremendous library, I mean, because all the plays are based on other people's books. And he visited every single manor house in the area every single house that would have had a library. And he came up with nothing, absolutely nothing. And of course, he was greatly disappointed. He says, something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong here. This man was not a writer. So he began to wonder, well, who did write the plays? And at the time, the only one he could think of who might have written them was Sir Francis Bacon, because Francis Bacon was this great intellect, and who also was a skilled writer. And so he thought it might be Bacon. And of course, that caused quite a row. And we have our first American 
Baconian, um, Delia Bacon, no relation to Bacon, but Delia Bacon, who had read all of Shakespeare and was convinced that these plays were written by a group of people, a philosophical group of people. There was so much philosophy in the plays that she said they had to be written by a, a group. This was in the 1850s. So she went to England uh, with the hope of finding proof of that. She thought that she could find the archives of this secret society. And it drove her out of her mind. So it's a wonderful story, but she, of course she wasn't able to find anything. And she even went to the church where Shakespeare is buried at night. Very spooky scene where she goes there. And she realizes that she's not going to find anything. She wanted to dig up the tomb to see if the archives of the secret society would be there. And of course, the, she never got the opportunity to do that. And she was brought back to the United States by a relative. And of course, she died very soon after. But she wrote a remarkable book about all of that. And uh, she did convince people like Emerson and Hawthorne that Shakespeare, that there was a question about his authorship. So it goes back to the 1850s in this country. Well, as I said, it was Calvin Hoffman in 1955 with his book, The Murder of the Man Who, Sha uh, uh, the Man Who Was Shakespeare, who was the first to assert in a book that there was a fake murder. And of course, uh, since then, we've been able to do a lot of, of work in that area. And I've done my own research on it and have come to the conclusion that that's exactly what happened. And all you have to do is read the, the coroner's inquest to see how phony it is and how everything fits. As I said, Shakespeare was a very intelligent man. He was a good businessman. He got rich as a front man, but he was not a writer. So what I would hope that you would do is read my book and read other books on this subject, and also, um, and also look at our websites. You know, the, we now have a wonderful blog. Let me write the name of the blog so you can see if you can spell it. It's the uh, Malo Shakespeare Connection blog. Malo Also, there is the International Malo Shakespeare Society, which has just been, we just created this website, this beautiful website, the International. And the reason why it's international is because the blog gets comments from all over the world. So this is a, this is a worldwide interest. There's also a very wonderful video made by Mike Rubo, uh, much about, um, uh, much ado about something it's called. It's a great video and PBS sells it. You can get it through PBS. The International Malo Shakespeare Society. Now all of this is very interesting. All of this is food for thought. <coughs> And uh, I'm sure that uh, it will invigorate you intellectually. You know, I spent seven years researching this book, and I had to read all of these wonderful plays. And I can tell you that was a tremendous experience. And what I advise you to do is to first read Mollum's works. You can get them in, in collected editions. And they're fabulous. They make fabulous reading. Uh, he wrote uh, translations of Ovid's poetry. He wrote the Dido, Queen of Carthage. 
he wrote Chamberlain. And Chamberlain was so successful that he immediately had to write a sequel, Chamberlain II. Uh, then he wrote uh, The Jew of Malta, which is not really an anti-Semitic play. You know, the interesting thing about The Jew of Malta and The, and the, and the Merchant of Venice, they're not really anti-Semitic plays because you have, you know, good Jews and bad Jews, you know, you have a villain. And also, they are plays mainly about economics. They're plays about money. That's the interesting thing about it. If you see it from that point of view, then you know that, uh, yes, Mahler was using these particular villains because they exhibited certain ideas about money and about economics. Uh, then he wrote uh, Dr. Faustus. Now, it's interesting, they, they, uh, the uh, enemies of Mahler claimed that he was an atheist, but I do not believe that an atheist could have written Dr. Faustus. I mean, that is a fantastic play with all sorts of wonderful theological arguments going on, debates between Dr. Faustus and Mephistopheles. And incidentally, in that play is the famous line, you know, when, when he uh, tells Mephistopheles that he wants to see Helen of Troy, you know, this great beauty. Uh, and she's brought before him. And what does he say? Is this the face that launched a thousand ships and burned the towers of Ilium? Uh, but then when you read uh, Troilus and Cressida, you realize that, uh, that Helen was a bimbo. <laughs> she was a Greek bimbo and very superficial, you know, like so many of those Hollywood bimbos, beautiful women but uh, with airheads. And she was an airhead also. As a matter of fact, I, I consider Troilus and Cressida probably to be the greatest play that uh, Mahler wrote. It is very cynical. He takes the he takes the, the Troy, the, the, the Trojan <coughs> War, and he reduces it to, he says, all of this was total nonsense. Total, utter nonsense and waste. What a waste. What a waste. And so when you read these plays, you're just astounded at the mentality of this writer. And the reason, one of the reasons why these plays are so extraordinary is because they were written in exile alone. You see, in those days, many plays were written by groups. If you read Henslow's diaries, Henslow was a theater producer, and he paid people to write plays for the stage because the stage was a booming business in Elizabethan days, and um, they needed plays. You know, every week they needed a new play, just as the local theater here, you know, the cinema needs a new movie and Hollywood churns them out. Well, you had all of these playwrights in, in, uh, in London churning out these plays, and they wrote in groups. They usually wrote, you know, there'd be a couple of together, and Henslow would pay them in advance, and they would write a play and, and bring it to him, and it would be produced. But Mahler's plays were written alone, because he didn't dare have a, a uh, uh, collaborator. He didn't need a collaborator. And so, and, and because he was in the state of mind that he was, where he could think, where he could express himself without worrying too much about the audience or pleasing a particular uh, producer, he was able to produce these masterpieces, these great plays. So that's, why the, that's another reason why they're worth, worth reading. Um, well, I've, I've given you base, a basic outline uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like to open this into a discussion, I'd be very glad to uh, answer them. Yes, sir? If uh, William Shakespeare was the front man and became wealthy, as you said, from these writings, how did uh, Christopher Marlowe make a living? How did he... That seems unlikely that so much money would be going to a front man and how, how did Marlowe make money? Well, how did Marlowe make money? Uh, apparently, there was enough money to go around. Also, he was working, he kept working for Burley. 
and for his son, Robert Cecil. So there was that income from the Secret Service. We don't know how it was transferred because there were all kinds of different names used. Uh, and uh, he had benefactors. And I would assume that uh, the Pembroke brothers might have also helped. And I imagine he lived rather modestly, that uh, he was not a um, spendthrift. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't live like nobility, although he could write about it very well. But uh, I don't see that as a problem. It's, it's, um, he, he, there's no doubt that there was, that he could make money. Take, for example, the poem, Venus and Adonis. The interesting thing about Venus and Adonis, let me explain that to you. Let me uh, remove this page. I hope all of you wrote down. When Marlow, uh, see, Marlow and Shakespeare were born in the same year. That is 1564. And Marlow, Marlow's writing career spans, you know, after he got out of Cambridge, ends in, the open career ends in 1593 when he is supposedly killed. Shakespeare's career begins in 1593. What was he doing between here and here? You know, here they're 29 years old, the two of them. And Shakespeare has done nothing that we know. We have no proof of anything. But the first time Shakespeare's name is on a particular uh, poem is Venus and Adonis. Venus and Adonis, V and A. And it isn't there as the author. It's, it's, he assigned a dedication to the Earl of Southampton, this young Earl. Uh, who was a literary, uh, uh, a lover of literature. Now, the interesting thing about Venus and Adonis, it's a very sexy poem. It's very erotic. And it's the story of Venus as she's trying to seduce Adonis. And he holds her off until she becomes absolutely passive. And that arouses him. Then he is aroused when she's totally passive, almost asleep. And I thought to myself, whose story is he telling? Is Venus the Countess of Pembroke, who went after him aggressively to get that heir? And was he, was he, was he talking about his own sexual predilections, that he liked passive women. He did not like aggressive women. That is, a particularly sexually aggressive women. And if you notice in, in Hero and Leander, Leander is the aggressor, and Hero is passive. You see. So I thought that was a wonderful thing. Now, so they published that, that poem a couple of months after Mahler was supposedly dead, even though Mahler had written out with the dedication to the Earl of Southampton. Now, Mahler had gone to Cambridge University, and Southampton had been there at the same time. And probably Mahler tutored the Earl of Southampton, because the Earl was one of Lord Burley's wards. You see, the, the Earl of Southampton's father was not there. He was a young man, and so uh, Lord Burley was, uh, was in charge of him. And also, since Lord Burley was chancellor of Cambridge University, he made sure that Southampton also uh, went to the university. And, and Mahler was there at the same time. They overlapped. Mahler was older, but they overlapped for a period of time. And I have the, and I, <clears throat> One of my hunches is that Mahler tutored Southampton. So, Ma so Southampton knew who wrote the Venus and Adonis.
But the reason why it was published was because it made money. It was, you know, a very sexy poem at a time when, uh, you know, England was, you didn't quite know whether it would be banned or not. And so Shakespeare was hired to put his name on that poem. And the reason why it was Shakespeare who was hired was because the poem was published by uh, a fellow by the name of Field who came from Stratford. So Shakespeare probably, when he came to London, went to Field, who was a fellow Stratfordian, and said, hey, can you get me a job? Do you know how I can make some money in London? And uh, probably the, uh, the, the Sir Thomas uh, Walsingham took the poem to Field and said, can you find a good front for this thing? And of course, he said, well, we got this guy, Shakespeare, who's uh, just arrived from the country, and he needs some work. Uh, he'd be very glad to put his name on it. So, and probably the dedication had been written by somebody, not, not by Shakespeare, not by Shakespeare. So that's how that happened. Yes? I thought it was fairly well established that Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, was an actor. Well, you know, it's very interesting about his being an actor. There's very little evidence that he was much of an actor. Uh, the, the, uh, the evidence about his being an, uh, an actor is so slight that some people, uh, some researchers now believe that he was not much of an actor, that he might have done some acting, but not very much. In other words, he was not a lead actor. He might have been a, taken a bit part or something like that. But I imagine that the reason, uh, the reason, uh, the reason why he uh, <coughs> he was successful was because he had access to these plays. That was a bonanza for him to be the front man of the greatest writer in the world. To have those plays delivered to him, and so the people around the Globe Theatre said, "Hey, this this is." We're not going to kill this goose that lays the golden eggs. All these great plays coming to us, and uh, probably Shakespeare never bothered to ask who wrote them. He didn't want to know. It was not in his interest to know who actually wrote them. It would have been too dangerous to know, since they had been written by somebody who was supposed to be dead. <clears throat> so the intrigue here is just <laughs> incredible. It's a fabulous story. Yes, Janine. Um, what's been the reaction from people when you go around um, and give these talks? Are you convincing people that Marlowe wrote the plays, or well, they hold like, it back Well, it's like this audience. I don't know what's in your minds here. You know, I don't know if I've convinced you or not. All I can say is that I urge you to read my book. Um, you know, help me turn it into a bestseller. <laughs> And also, uh, read other books. We, we, if, if you look at our website, you'll see the enormous interest that there is in the, all of this and the details. We have scholars now, uh, people interested in this subject. For example, on the, on the whole issue of whether, Malo was, uh, whether Shakespeare was actually did much acting. And there are people who have dug and dug. For example, Diana Price. Uh, wrote a wonderful book called The Unorthodox, uh, Unorthodox Biography of William Shakespeare, in which she examined every single document related to Shakespeare. And she said they're, they're about real estate, they're, you know, they're about litigation, uh, they're about buying and selling uh, commodities, but nothing about being a writer. And she came to the conclusion that he wasn't a writer. And, but, uh, she didn't uh, offer her solution to the problem. She only, uh, she only suggested that somebody should write a book and find out who was the actual author. And there's no doubt in my mind that it was Marlowe because he fits every single aspect of this. He was the only genius, the only genius there at the time who could write these plays. Uh, the, um, well, there's Bacon, uh, though. Well, Bacon. well, Bacon, you see, was, uh, did not, uh, he, his style was not to write this sort of thing. Bacon wrote an awful lot. He was a philosopher. He was a sociologist. 
an essayist, but he was not a great player. He was not a playwright. And the same could be said the Earl of Oxford. All we have are 12 poems that he wrote as a young man, and they're very mediocre. That's all we have to go on with him. And, uh, uh, and, he, and, and so he, he did not have the genius. It wasn't there. The only one whom we know had the genius to write these plays was, was uh, Christopher Marlowe. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, towards the beginning of, the, uh, of your presentation, and a very fine one. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. It piqued my curiosity. Uh, <laughs> about this, this rabble-rouser Puritan. Yeah. who is believed to be, have been uh, buried and so forth. We see now in, in current day um, investigations, uh, people looking back through medical genetics and forensics to either prove or disprove lineage or what have you. Has anything anywhere been undertaken to, to prove or disprove that that grave well, that's a very interesting question. You know, that, incidentally, there have been studies made, word studies, of Marlowe's plays and Shakespeare's plays, and they match beautifully. Perfect, perfect match. Vocabulary, size of words, and that sort of thing. Uh, as far as, say, digging, digging up the bones in the churchyard in Deptford to see if, uh, if that is actually John Penry would be interesting to do. Now, Calvin Hoffner, he had this idea that Malo and, and uh, Thomas Walsingham were lovers. That was his idea. And so he thought that maybe Thomas Walsingham buried the manuscripts of the plays in the tomb with himself. And so he actually got permission to open the tomb of, of uh, Sir uh, Thomas Walsingham, and all they found was sand. They didn't find any manuscripts. Now there's also a, um, a move to uh, open the tomb of um, another gentleman who was a friend of, uh, of Philip Sidney's, uh, Fulk Greville, Fulk Greville, whom some people think wrote the plays also. <clears throat> but. Uh, it's one of these fly-by-night things. It's possible that someday they can do the kind of examination that you suggest. I, I, I'd be all for it. You know. Yeah. You, there, there are some plays that are you know, written, signed by Christopher Marlowe, right. and then you're claiming that he wrote the Shakespeare plays. The question first is, how, how could he have written so many? But the second question is, why would he sign some? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I didn't say he signed any of them in, in the first folio. He put clues in them. In no, the no, but I thought you mentioned several that, that are attributed to him, like you mentioned Faust. There was a oh, Faust. yeah, those, those plays are generally uh, admitted to be his. Right. It's not, it's not that he admitted to writing himself, yeah. but why, you know, how can you rationalize why he would admit to writing some and then and some? <laughs> well, as I said, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't come out and say that he was alive. Uh, because that no, but he did. He did write. You said you, you quoted. There were quite a number of plays that are, are works like like Faustus that he did. He signed off on that. Yeah. At Christopher Marlowe's Faustus, that's a well known. Well, yeah, that's well thing. known, right? But that was before the the, the fake death. Oh, that was before the fake death. They were death. all written before 1593. Oh, and he was quite young then, relatively. Oh, young. Yes, yes. That's why. That's why we know he was such a great genius because he was able to write the plays of that caliber at such a, a young age. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, that would explain yeah. it then. Yeah. But after that, after fifty nine, after the fake death, and there was yeah, nothing, so. uh, there was yeah. nothing under his name. I, that's okay. right. Okay. That's right. Yes. That's um, right. So, how did the, who died first? I mean, did I mean did I mean it's real death? I mean, Obviously, Christopher Milo did die. Well, uh, Shakespeare died in 1616. That was before the first folio was published. 1616, the first folio was uh, 1623. Let me write that down. You have um, Shakespeare dying in 1616, and the first folio is 1623. 
We don't know what Marlowe died. No, I, I, I really believe that he lived beyond 1623, and I'll tell you why. Because some of the plays in the first folio had to be edited, and, there are, and scholars have found lines written in the plays in the first folio that differ from quarto publications that could have only been written by the author. Well, Shakespeare was dead, so the only author who could have written it was, would, would have been Shakespeare, uh, Marlowe. And incidentally, Marlowe came from a family where there were some, several people who lived rather long lives. He had a sister who lived into her 80s. So it was not unusual for some people to live, to become quite old. Yes, sir, you had your hand. Yeah, uh, in the sonnets, there's quite a bit of punning on Will. Uh, that is, will as a first name, will as knowing thy will, I will. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. same thing. Why would Christopher Marlowe do that sort of <laughs> punning on someone well, else's he name? He probably knew that Will Shakespeare's name was being used, you see. But weren't the Shakespeare, I mean, weren't the sonnets very personal, not even really oh, yeah. intended for publication? Sonic, we believe the sonnets are very autobiographical. And if you read the first 17 sonnets, I believe were written at the behest of Lord Burley, who wanted the Earl of Southampton to marry his granddaughter. So you have all of those sonnets that are telling this young, handsome man to reproduce himself, get married, and all of that. And of course, the sonnets didn't do the job. But then there are the sonnets about exile. There are sonnets about, uh, you know, about his outcast state. Uh, there are so many sonnets that, that reflect the autobiography of, of uh, Marlowe. And the ones where the puns are made about Will, I'm not sure exactly the, the exact explanation for that, but I would assume that, they, that, that Marlowe knew whose name was being put on his plays. Must have been told, he must have known it from, from Blount. Well, I might have told him, you know, we're using this guy's name. Because he knew that somebody else's name was being put on the plays, that there was a front. Uh, there was no reason why he wouldn't have known that. So that might be uh, an explanation for that. Yes? Marla lived in Italy under an assumed name. Uh, do we know what the assumed name is? No, there, there have been interesting uh, attempts to find out from Italian sources uh, whether they have any information or data or historical documents that would attest to his having been in Italy. And uh, recently uh, a, uh, a Venetian scholar or professor wrote a book about Shakespeare in Italy. He said that the writer of those plays had to have been there because he talks in details about certain aspects of the scenes which could have only been written by somebody who had been there and seen them. So, uh, but all of this is open. You see, the interesting thing about this Marlowe Shakespeare thing is scholars have spent the last 200 years, armies of scholars, scourging for Shakespeare, looking for stuff about Shakespeare, not Marlowe. And they've come up with nothing. For example, the Wallaces, uh, Professor Wallace and his wife at the turn of the last century, went through a million documents in the public records office in London. And the only thing they came up with was this litigation that, that Shakespeare was involved in, in this case of this uh, gal who had been uh, jilted by him by a man, and uh, Shakespeare happened to be living in that house, so he knew something about the case. That's it. That's all they came up with. Nothing having to do with his literary career. Now, if an army of scholars who had, sp had spent one-tenth of the time looking into Marlowe's background, God knows what they would have come up with by now, you know, particularly in Italy, you know, they could 
but uh, it takes money to do that. All the money has been spent in looking for records about Shakespeare. And there's nothing there, you see. There's nothing there. He wasn't a writer, so there's no, they're not going to find anything, <coughs> no matter how much money they spend. <coughs> so this uh, serious scholarly work has been going on for 200 years. Right. But the name Shakespeare is still there. So oh, to yes. give Marlowe the correct attribution, they would have to change it to Marlowe, and it seems after 200 years it's not going to happen. Well, you're probably right. You're probably yeah. right that, but you know, things are beginning to happen. There was a, an article in the New York Times this last weekend about the Marlowe revival. All of a sudden, they're thinking of making movies about Marlowe. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't know if they're going to make one about Marlowe being the author, but uh, their plays, they're, they're staging Marlowe's plays, and um, so, so things may happen. We just don't know because the shakes, the Stratfordians are on very thin ice, very thin ice these days, and they are totally on the defensive now. And with these new uh, blogs and new websites, uh, things are going to begin to shake things up. So I hope I live long enough to see the change take place. You know. I'm, or on in years, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, I started writing this book when I was in my 70s, and by the time I was 80, I got it done, so there's hope for us senior <laughs> citizens. <laughs> Keeps your mind active, right, you know, this right. sort of thing. It's a wonderful if, testimony. If, right. <laughs> if you really want to liven your mind, Read Marlowe and Shakespeare. Those plays will do it. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> your, your mind will light up. It's fantastic stuff. One for all. <laughs> <laughs> or any other questions? If any of you would like, I will gladly sign copies of this book. They're $45, very little these days, considering the cost of things. And um, great reading. <laughs> I go through every single play of the 36 plays of the first folio and point out the clues that I was able to find, very obvious clues. And the reviewers so far who have read the book and have reviewed it on Amazon, and you can read reviews on Amazon about the book, they all remark on how astounding they were to see that there were all these uh, clues these Malovian clues in the 36 plays. So that's uh, one of the good reasons why you, you might want to read the book. It's the end of the summer, but you might curl up and you know, the winter is coming. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to watch TV. Right. Yeah.